Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Monday the 18th of September. Now, I'm going to be looking at some research on vitamin D that's come from Japan today. Now, note this research is not from Canada, not from New Zealand, not from the United States, not from the United Kingdom. It wasn't conducted out by a large-scale pharmaceutical industry or company. It was conducted by local clinicians and uh, academics in Japan. Pity we can't manage to do this kind of research in our countries, some might think. And of course, vitamin D is remarkably cheap. Pharmaceutical industries probably wouldn't want to spend $10 million on a clinical trial because they can't get their money back because it's already uh, out of patent. It's a generically available molecule. And not only that, if vitamin D did turn out in a large-scale randomised control trial to be exquisitely effective, then who knows, that might influence the sales of other products that pharmaceutical industries make, but that's all speculation. Let's look at what we know. This is giving activated vitamin D, and it's a study from Japan, as we've said, in the Delta and the Omicron era of COVID. Now, we've looked at the benefits of vitamin D on this channel numerous times, um, preventing colon, colon cancer um, or reducing the incidence of colon cancer, almost certainly reducing the incidence of numerous other cancers, reducing heart disease, reducing the likelihood of diabetes, reducing the likelihood of dementia, uh, and of course the whole immunity boosting uh, properties of vitamin D, and the anti-inflammatory properties, and probably a few others I can't quite remember off, off, offhand. But that's what this is looking at, it's specifically looking at, at uh, the effect of um, vitamin D supplementation in the COVID pandemic. But it probably work equally well for other infections. They had an intervention group and a control group. Now, because this didn't have a large-scale funding, it was a retrospective study. What they did was they, took, they looked at people that had the activated vitamin D and compared those to people that hadn't. So they did have an intervention group, they did have a control group, but it was retrospective. Obviously, we'd like it to be prospective on a much larger scale, but as we've said, that costs a lot of money. But despite that, the data that's come out of this is really quite significant. Now, interestingly, they did find low vitamin D concentrations in between 65 and 77 percent of the people that actually went into the trial. So in Japan, as in other countries, a lot of people already have really quite low levels of vitamin D. And it's the people with the lowest levels of vitamin D that probably benefit most from the supplementation of the vitamin D. This is low hanging fruit that we really need to pick for the health of uh, ourselves and the people around us. Now, uh, the vitamin D group, uh, in terms of needing respiratory support, 6% needed respi respiratory support, whereas in the control group it was 14%. And that's a significant difference, given the numbers. Um, th that that's basically demonstrates a very high probability of efficacy. In terms of needing high-flow oxygen... 4% in the vitamin D group needed high flow oxygen, but it was 11% in the placebo group. Now, in terms of death, uh, the people in the vitamin D group, 3% died. These were people that were being admitted to hospital, were already ill, of course, 5% in the control group. But the difference there was not enough to be significant, so we can't say there is a difference there. If the numbers had been larger, then, of course, the picture could have been very different. But there was a decrease in survival of controls over time. So as time went on, the controls were less likely to survive. So that's what this is about if you want to watch. Now, I'm uh, just going to give a bit of background biology here just before we uh, delve into this. So what actually happens here is the skin will produce vitamin D in response to sunlight, as we know. And we can also absorb vitamin D from the gastrointestinal tract. This is the stomach. Now that then goes in the blood to the liver and the liver is the biochemical factory of the body it processes it and it turns it into something called chalcifidiol but that chalcifidiol itself then goes to the kidney for further processing into a molecule called calcitrol and it was this molecule here that the Japanese researchers were actually giving and it's this molecule here which is believed to have most of the biological effects on the DNA, on the cells and uh, the body cells and the immune cells. So that's what they were given. They're kind of shortcutting the process because if you take vitamin D orally, for example, or in the sun, it can take days to a week or two to get through the liver and the kidneys to get into the active form. Therefore, if you're already ill, there's not a lot of point if you're already ill taking, well, 
maybe in the very early stages, but if you're taking vitamin D tablets, the ordinary D3 that we get from the uh, supermarket or our, our pharmacists, that would take time to activate. So really quite clever that the Japanese were, were bypassing this. Now, here's the study here from Japan. This is the study here. And we'll be comparing with uh, data from this other. This, so this is just out. This is just the end of August 2023. We'll be comparing it with this study from 2020 and this study from uh, 2020 as well, I believe. Yeah, 2020. And we'll find that these three studies uh, are basically in agreement. So while we haven't got one huge mega study like we'd like with tens of thousands of people across different uh, continents, ch te checking the difference between giving one molecule or the other molecule or, or the third molecule, um, that would be the best thing to do. Checking that against uh, placebo, checking that against other medications. Given that that hasn't happened, this is the next best thing we've got. So let's let's dive into the detail now. So this is the study published in Clinical Nutrition. It's a peer-reviewed journal. So this is this is pretty good quality science, really, despite the small scale of the study. Vitamin D deficiency is associated with elevated risk, uh, severity and mortality, as we said, using the example of COVID. But it's also true in asthma. So less people, if people are low in vitamin D, they're more likely to die from or get sick from asthma. Tuberculosis, which of course can be largely respiratory. Chronic pulmonary obstructive disease, which is so common, so common in our societies. And viral respiratory infections. So we know that vitamin D, low level vitamin D levels give a worse prognosis for all of these conditions. And um, the fact that the government said nothing about this during the COVID pandemic really is incredible, quite incredible. Now, this, this is the first consistent paper here that we looked at, which is uh, this one. So uh, comparing it with this paper here. Now, what what is this saying? Well... This paper here is, uh, says vitamin D is essential for several cellular processes, wound healing, immunity and uh, inflammation. And we also know that there are vitamin D receptors in every type of immune cell. So you probably know there's different sorts of immune cells. There's, there's neutrophils that specialise in combating bacterial infection. There's lymphocytes which specialise in combating uh, viral infections. And there's, there's other things like uh, the, the, the big monocytes that become macrophages that a phagocytic can gobble up um, foreign material. All of these cells have vitamin D receptors. So it's reasonable to assume that all of these cells need adequate amounts of vitamin D to optimise their function. It's, it works at the cellular level. Uh, studies have displayed strong interrelationships with vitamin D deficiency uh, and progression of lung disorders, according to this other paper. Um, it's ease of supplementation and development of personalised medicine. So it's easy to bunk it up. You just take a few tablets for a week or two. You just bunk it. It's easy to bunk up. Could lead to an effective adjunct and cost-effective, essentially free, cost-effective uh, therapeutic modality for high fatality pulmonary disease and of course sadly I have seen so many people die of lung disease so that makes sense the other consistent paper that we're looking at is from 2020 evidence that vitamin d supplementation could reduce risk of influenza and covid infections and deaths check out the references for yourselves I always uh, supply them now, to reduce the risk of infection, this paper says, it's recommended that people at risk of influenza and or COVID-19 consider taking 10,000 international units of vitamin D3 for a few weeks to rapidly increase their vitamin D blood levels. And of course, that will feed through to the activated form through the kidneys. And then they say followed by 5,000 international units a day. So this, is, this paper is saying, People that are low, that are at risk of COVID, should bunk it up fairly quickly with 10,000 units a day and then followed by 5,000 units a day as a maintenance dose. They say the goal should be to raise vitamin D concentrations in the plasma to 40 to 60 nanograms per mil. That's 100 to 150 nanomoles per litre. It's a pity we measure this differently. This is the way it's typically measured in the United States. And this is the way it's measured in the UK, but it's the same. 
Now, of course, this is uh, what this paper says. I can't advise you what to take. Ideally, you would get your blood levels checked. Now, I've been trying to get my GP to check my blood levels of vitamin D for a few years, and I have now succeeded. So I now, as of the end of August, I know what my vitamin D levels are, and I'm going to reveal that to you now. So uh, my vitamin D levels at the end of August were uh, 85 uh, nanomoles per litre. And that translates into 34 nanograms per mil. Now, if you take the normal range here is considered to be 20 to 60, you can see I'm not, or the normal range there is considered to be 50 to 100. You can see that mine aren't that high. Um, 85 nanomoles, 34 nanograms. So just to be completely clear, that and that are exactly the same amount in the blood. It's just different units. Now, I was surprised how low it was. Because um, typically I've been taking four to 8,000 units of vitamin D a day. But then when the sunny weather came along, I stopped taking that and I just went out in the sun. And then, you know, I dig my gardens and my allotment in the sun and, I, you know, get some sunbathing in when I got the time. <laughs> I'd, I'd had a fair bit of sun exposure. And, um, and yet, after all this, at the end of the summer, my vitamin D levels weren't that high. And that's with some supplementation. So personally, I've increased the amount of supplements. So I'm taking 8,000 units a day now to try and bunk that up a bit. Because really, I think... And we really could debate these levels here as well. I mean, are these levels that are given as normal, uh, 20 to 60 nanograms a milli, is that the ideal level? Or should they really be a bit higher than that? Because a lot of these vitamin D recommendations were the levels which were advised to prevent rickets. Whereas what we want is the levels to optimise the immune system. And, well, optimise the anti-cancer anti system and the anti-heart disease system and the anti-dementia system and the anti-diabetes system. All these things as well we need, we need to optimise. So a bit disappointed how low mine was, to be quite honest. So ideally, everyone would get their blood levels checked by the doctor and they would titrate those accordingly. But um, that's what that paper said there. Uh, but of course, I can't advise you what to, what to take. Uh, for treatment of people who become infected with COVID-19, higher D3 doses might be useful. And, and of course, as influenza season comes up, why don't we optimise our vitamin D levels? Because we know that this is uh, important for immunity. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is relatively common, according to the original paper. So we're back at the Japanese paper now. We're looking at uh, the original, um, this original paper from Japan. Surprisingly common, actually, um, especially among the elderly, people with obesity. Now, the elderly don't get out as much. People with obesity, um, vitamin uh, D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so people that are obese end up with less in the blood. So people that are obese, you would have to give much higher doses for much longer to top their blood levels up because the vitamin D goes into the fatty tissues. Um, and patients also who were low on vitamin D with comorbidities, including hypertension, which is cause and effect there, of course, is an interesting question. Uh, diabetes, um, again, is there some effect on metabolism, on, on absorption there? We don't know. COPD, often they don't get out as much either. And chronic kidney disease. And if it's got chronic kidney disease, the kidneys may not be working as well, so they don't translate it into the active form. And of course, it just so happens that these are all the major risk factors for COVID. So is there an overlap here? Is it the lack of vitamin D that's predisposing to severe COVID? Partly is probably the answer to that. How partly, we don't really know. Uh, but the paper does say that vitamin D induces production of antiviral peptides, one called defensin, for example. And, and, and these go in the, uh, in the respiratory passages, so help protect us from viral infections. Upregulates anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin. 10, so you get more of that as an anti-inflammatory, but it downregulates pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 1, interleukin 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. So it downregulates those pro-inflammatory cytokines. If there's less of those, there's less boosting to the inflammatory process. Vitamin D affects the angiotensin converting enzyme axis, which of course is the receptor site for the COVID uh, 
virus, the, the SARS coronavirus 2 specifically. So there's probably some extra specific anti-COVID effect there. And uh, vitamin D also has a protective effect against uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which, as you remember, when in the early stages of COVID, the alveoli, the air sacs in people's lungs that are essential to get the oxygen into the blood and the carbon dioxide from the blood back into the air to be breathed out, these fill up with water, inflammatory fluids. That's acute respiratory distress syndrome. Part of the reason people were dying, as well as the uh, intravascular effects, of course. Uh, 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 efficacy of activated vitamin D supplementation in coronavirus. So that, 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 that's what this study is looking at, the effect of the activated form. The activated form. So as we said there, completely bypassing the body system and giving this activated form in tablets straight away, which makes a lot of sense because these people were already uh, poorly, of course. So it was prescribed on day one or day two. Generally for these treatments, the earlier you give them, the better. Uh, potential treatments which are effective in COVID, um, can't remember any just now, but uh, treatments which are potentially effective in, in COVID are always more efficacious if they're given early in the disease process, as early as possible in the disease process. If you wait till someone's already got a cytokine storm, then probably all you can do to treat that is give the steroids rather than the more specific therapies. Um, so they wanted to evaluate the effect of this activated vitamin D on the presentation and severity and mortality in patients hospitalised with COVID. So these are hospitalised patients, not a preventative routine like the previous paper and doses that we discussed. Now, they looked at data from April 2021 to October 2021, which was Delta time, and they also looked at uh, Omicron time as well. But it doesn't matter really because they were comparing those that had the activated vitamin D and those that hadn't. So they were comparing like with uh, like, which of course is the key thing in, in uh, controlled trials. Um, that's what they gave to the active group. What they were looking for is the need for additional respiratory support, need for oxygen and uh, in-hospital mortality rate. These were the, uh, the outcomes that they wanted to monitor. Now, the experimental group, not that large. They looked back, there was 122 patients. As we've said, this should be done properly on a huge scale, but that would cost money. And um, it would have to be sponsored by someone. And uh, industry that sponsors most of these trials is simply not, has not done that so far. Um, median age was 66 in the this, so this is the group that had the experimental group had the vitamin D and their baseline vitamin D deficiency was really quite high 77% slightly younger in the control group 58% uh, was the median age and the age difference wasn't really quite significant although it was getting close to it so basically the people in the uh, vitamin D group were slightly uh, older on average um, Baseline vitamin D deficiency is 65% in the control group and the baseline deficiency, the difference between the control group and the experimental group that had the vitamin D was uh, not significant, but it was 0 0.07, so it was nearing significance. Um, right, proportion of those requiring more respiratory support in hospital mortality, so the vitamin D group required more Respiratory support, 6% of the time. The control group, it was 14% of the time. So we see the vitamin D group required uh, respiratory support much less. And that result is highly significant, P equals 0 0.001. So that's 99% uh, likely to be an accurate result, which we count a highly significant result in, in research terms. Now, after what they did uh, called propensity scoring, so what they did in propensity scoring was they looked at the differences between the two groups, what medications were they on, what were the comorbidities, what were the age, um, and they, they tried to account for these factors, and they still found it was significant. Uh, so it w went down to P equals 0 0.03, that means there was still 97% sure there was a real, uh, a real effect. So again, it's, it's significant data. Had the numbers been um, way larger and the differences between the two groups as great, then the p-values would have been much, much smaller and the level of certainty would have been much, much 
higher. Um, now, th this shows, this is, the, this is the survival. This is the control group here. So we find that uh, over time, the su survivability in the control group actually went down quite, uh, quite dramatically. So the control group just weren't surviving as long as time went on. Uh, down to about, what, 40% there. Um, so much lower proportions of survival in the control group compared to the vitamin D group. So over time, this indicates that the effect is becoming more, uh, more significant over time. As time went on, the survival, sadly, uh, in the control group went down. Whereas in the vitamin D group, the survival stayed higher. More patients surviving. Just to break it down a little bit more, uh, the vitamin D group, uh, proportion of patients who required high flow oxygen, 4%. Control group, it was 11%. Uh, again, that result was significant. In hospital mortality, 3% versus 5%. P-value there, not significant because the numbers of people dying weren't large enough to get statistical significance. But need for additional respiratory support, 6% versus 14%. They concluded it works. It may improve. Well, no, they concluded it may, to be fair. The proper researchers may <coughs> may improve outcomes. It looks fairly probable from what we've said. Reducing composite outcomes, including the need for additional respiratory support and in-hospital mortality. So... Um, Low cost. They didn't report any adverse uh, events. There was no high levels of uh, calcium. Uh, when you take vitamin D, if you take very high amounts of vitamin D, it can liberate some free calcium. And the thing there is to take some vitamin K2. Because if you take the vitamin K2, the K2 sequesters that calcium into the bones and not into the tissues. So it makes your bones stronger. So personally, I take vitamin D with uh, K2. We don't get much K2 in our diet in Western countries because it comes from fermented foods. So um, from this, no side effects reported, so looks pretty safe. No significant adverse reactions reported, and it uh, looks pretty safe. And from the data we have, it looks to be effective. I wouldn't like to use the term safe and effective, but this is what that study uh, indicates. So pretty interesting, low-cost treatment. Why isn't this being researched all over the place and rolled out? I think we know the answer to that. Now, um, I'm going to put a link um, to download my textbook. So if you want to brush up on physiology, I think we've had about half a million downloads of these now. So this must be one of the world's most read physiology books. Uh, largely, of course, because it's free. You can download it free. If you do live in the UK and you want a hard copy of this one, I'll put a link on. I've still got a few hundred left. Um, I need to get around to doing another print run at some stage. Um, but um, the physiology book is there, but completely free download, high resolution PDFs, print it out, put it in your workbooks, do what you want with it. I'll put it in the public domain. And my pathophysiology notes. Now, I haven't got this in hard copy at the moment. I haven't had time to update it. But um, again, you can download the whole thing in high resolution PDF or completely uh, free. Uh, for your educational uh, interest. Um, it is really some really interesting stuff in this. When, when, you, when you write something, you kind of forget about it, then you go back and look at it and think, oh, uh, that's quite interesting, that. <laughs> something I've written a few years ago. But, but uh, anyway, that's them. Free downloads um, as you would uh, choose. And for now, thank you for watching. Um, it's just a pity we don't have more safe, effective, low-cost remedies, sometimes based on things that are freely available or very, very cheaply available, sometimes based on things like repurposed drugs, more uh, natural uh, natural compounds, more optimization of diet, more optimization of the microbiome, more optimization of vitamin D levels, all of these things. Uh, more exercise, making sure we get plenty of sleep, all of these things that can promote health that don't cost anything, therefore often don't get promoted by clinical trials. It's a sad situation, but it's where we are. But that's probably why you're watching this video. If you stayed to the end, thank you for, for watching. Don't forget to do the free downloads.